Welcome everyone to Catholic Family News. I'm the production manager here at CFN, Murray Rundus, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Ryan Grant. Ryan Grant is well known throughout the uh, traditionalist circles for his translations of St. Robert Bellarmine, things like uh, On the Most Holy Sacrifice, and basically a, a good amount of the De Controversies uh, writings of St. Robert Bellarmine. He's also uh, oversees Mediatrix Press, which sells those translations. Uh, how are you doing, Ryan? I'm doing all right, uh, although there's there's a lot more of the controversies to go. I'm afraid, but <laughs> yeah, it's quite a uh, quite a we're, big we'll work. <laughs> yeah, right. So to begin, yeah, really on that. Yeah, right. So it's such a huge work. I think many people know about um, your translations of St. Robert Bellarmine, but many people don't know about the man behind the translations uh, and your history. I know uh, I'm under the impression you were baptized Episcopalian and that you weren't raised Catholic. How did you get That's to the right. point of being um, raised in that environment to getting to uh, translating uh, all of this great St. Robert Bellarmine? Well, there's a lot to, to fill into that, but mm. um, from a largely agnostic, uh, not, not by like active teaching, but rather just default, we didn't do anything. Um, mm. uh, went back to, my mother went back to our Jewish roots a little bit half-heartedly uh, when we were with our relatives in Connecticut her, on her side of the family. And mm -hmm. so my first religious experience was uh, in temple, was in uh, synagogue, which I don't remember very much of, except for people's backs and Hebrew prayers that I didn't get, and uh, pastries afterwards and rye bread and things like that. So, oh. um, you know, so if there's for all that we could say against uh, you know certain uh, certain people who claim Old Testament lineage, uh, I'm not sure about uh, getting banned on YouTube or whatnot. So. What watch how I do it, but um, they've got pastries right and they've got food right. <laughs> and so um, for all the jokes you want to make about matzah and whatnot. Uh, that was my, kind of my first experience. And then that fell away when uh, my great grandmother died, uh, who was Orthodox and everyone else was really an atheist and just keeping up for her. So uh, Shabbat, Tabernacles, uh, Hanukkah, Rosh Hashanah, all went away. Didn't do that anymore. And then just, uh, you know, through the different things I'd this sense when I was a teenager, oh, I should, I should go to church. We should learn about this Jesus guy. That, that's all I knew about, about our Lord at the time because I had zero religious instruction. So we went back to the Episcopal Church, you know, to, which actually was reasonably traditional at the, you know, at the time. And they, they had an altar rail still that you went to, to receive at and... Um, it's kind of, I guess, a, a prep because then when I when I did eventually, you know, start discovering the traditional mass and, and the church's tradition, I said, "Wow, I remember some of this stuff of the Episcopal Church because there are certain things that do carry over into the Book of Common Prayer, in spite of all the anti, the heret heretical stuff in that book." So, my mother was watching actually Mother Angelica and EWTN, and she desired she wanted to go back to the Eucharist. And my dad, we well, haven't mentioned, uh, he's still alive. He's uh, he's a Protestant, and so. He's not worried one way or the other what, what anyone's doing. And so uh, my mother went back to the Catholic Church, got reconciled, and then uh, my brother and I came in, and I didn't know any. It was kind of like a switch from one church to the other, as far as I was concerned. didn't really mean much at the time because I just didn't know anything. And so there was like a, a gradual process whereby, you know, I'm learning a little more about the faith and a little more and trying to catch some sermons, and then I get things like, well, wait a minute. So, because I'm I'm 16 at the time, and it's like birth control is wrong. It sounded like the craziest, most medieval thing anyone could possibly say. <laughs> How can that be wrong? That's it's um, that's just kind of nutty. And so I didn't understand it. And then it was a couple years later, somebody explained it to me. Said, "Oh, that actually makes sense. Okay, I get it." You know, and um, other things like this. It was just a, a long period of deconstructing so much. I went to public school. Public school taught me to be a communist, essentially, without me knowing what a communist was or what any of that stuff. It was just the default. That's just what you learn. And But at the time, I still had the old liberals, so they taught you a little bit of critical thinking. And then, you know, and I was kind of surprised when they're all like, rah, rah, Bill Clinton. And then all of a sudden, Bill Clinton's going in wars in the Middle East, and they're like, well... You know, that wasn't so good. It's like, wait a minute, I thought you said Clinton was great. And he's like, well, yeah, but now he's he's acting like a Republican. <laughs> That's what they said, <laughs> which is kind of my first introduction to uh, the uni party 
as it were, in the beginning of my becoming agnostic on politics as I became more fervent in faith. But I went to Steubenville, to Franciscan University, where um, I was, you know, a lot of various problems from my upbringing and they were now coming, you know, to the fore. I was on my own. Good chance to get in a lot of mischief and other things and just the lack, abominable lack of knowledge. And so ultimately, if I could summarize university, it would be more or less deprogramming the nonsense in public schools so that university became what I should have been doing in high school. And my postgraduate work has essentially been everything I should have been doing in college, really starting off that way, getting um, you know, a base. And so I thought I had a call to the priesthood, so I was learning Latin and uh, did all right enough, you know, teaching myself Latin and whatnot, but it just hadn't quite got there yet. So, and, and it goes, taking theology, so I well, if you're going to be a good theologian, you got to know Latin, because almost all the stuff that people used to write about is in Latin. Somebody had brought me to a traditional Latin mass. Actually, it's a fraternity of St. Peter priest now. And uh, I'd never seen it before. I, I was vaguely aware that before Vatican II, mass was in Latin. And I just imagined it to be kind of like the, the mass we've seen. A buttress that idea, the campus had a Novus Ordo mass in Latin once a month. And so that kind of buttressed the idea that, oh, this is what they did back in the, the old days. Oh, okay. And of course, it's not true, apart from they did a very nice music at a good school. I did a lot of uh, polyphonic and chant pieces, but that, you know, so he took me to a traditional mass and I was just blown away. I was like, wow, that, that was just amazing. And, but what was more is the hostility I got for it. So it just got me digging deeper into the tradition and learning more and, and going about it. And, um, it became known as, uh, you know, here's Ryan. He's going to talk about the traditional mass. No, <laughs> it's just the thing I just became so engrossed in, but also being socially not quite adjusted for how to, you know, work with people and, and not be that awkward guy, that autistic trad over there in the corner that we don't want to <laughs> deal with. You know, so it, it was a number of years of maturing that had to happen, you know, for that. So, but I, you know, I eventually did, I got tired. Like I'd gone through every grammar book. I passed Latin extremely well in my short stint in seminary. So um, it was, uh, but I still couldn't read it authentically. So finally I just got tired of all the you know books and flashcards and all these things. I laid out, um, it was either St. Augustine or it was Cicero. I can't remember what. I think it was St. Augustine. And I don't remember which work. And I went through it. And I understood probably about 60% of it, but there were things that were missing in the syntax. And so I just went in and and their vocabulary. Certainly. So I just met, you know, worked basically every time I read it. I would, you know, look up the words and read it again, get it in the context, and just fix my mind that this word means this, at least in this mm-hmm. way anyway. Because some words have obviously multiple meanings depending on your context in there that are mm-hmm. more you know d- distinct in their usages or whatnot. But anyway, so I did that and I did it again and I kept doing it. And then I had that page 100% down. Next page, I understood a lot more of the next page, and I just kept going that way, right? And mm-hmm. so it's a sort of natural method that's recommended in other books. And obviously, if I, I can ask you something about that, um, you know, we have there's there seems to be especially with the with the advent of the internet and uh, more resources becoming more widespread. There seems to be a Latin revival in a way, even among non-Catholics. I'm sure the mm-hmm. traditional mass plays a, a big role on it. Something that's often recommended is the um, is Hans Orberg's book, uh, Lingua right. Latina. Is that something you would promote? What do you think is the best method if somebody was saying, "I want to learn Latin, I want to be deep in the history of the church"? Would you would you suggest them? Start start out something like that? Or would, would you suggest just pick up a Latin text like you do? What, what right. would be good for somebody just beginning? I had the the grammar and a good amount of the syntax behind me when I picked up a Latin text and, and just forced that, that reading and then learning it through Latin. So it's a different experience than if like you're... So like Hans Orberg's Lingua Latina, Prese la Strata, it's a great book. Um, I taught at, out of that for a number of years. It is a fantastic, brilliant text in terms of a grammatical presentation, but it's in Latin that itself becomes witty and funny. But oftentimes, like in a classroom setting, it's hard to, your teacher has to be very inventive. He has to know it very well or or be learning it very well in order to keep his classroom moving in Latin and not and resist that translation, that, that temptation to go to grammar translation model through Orberg and, and, and start having everybody translate the text out. Because the whole point is that you understand the Latin natively, just like 
If you learn French very well, you learn Italian very well, you know that language before you start, you know, obviously you know grammar like this tense and you use this tense here, but if you're learning that language, even as a second language, like you're traveling through the country and you needed to pick it up to do business or something, you learn how to speak and, and, and saying the words correctly before you get a more formalized grammar. And <clears throat> so, you know, the things that are, that belong to the more formal study of grammar, like sentence diagramming and stuff they used to have you do in books and, you know, from the, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, that's stuff for higher grammar. That's, that's not for learning your language. You don't learn a language through sentence diagramming. It helps you understand more complicated things and parse grammar and understand the grammar more natively once you've got it, but you have to know how to speak first. Mm. You know, there's a difference. So, uh, you know, Orberg's text is excellent for that, but it's, unless you're an extremely driven student and you have people to ask questions for, it's very difficult to use as a self-taught text. It can mm. work that way. It's also harder for English speakers than it is for people who speak Latin languages because of things like grammatical gender, which is a very difficult concept for Americans to get. Wait, well, why, why is the light feminine? The light's just light. Well, because it is, because it looks as feminine. That's just the way it is. Mm. And, uh, and so, and, and it, you know, it's just a type of thing. You know, it doesn't have any reference to the actual, whereas in English, we're used to, all you know all gender in language is re references biology that is references biological sex mm. not so in classical language or in many languages today i mean arabic german whatever i mean they, they they all have grammatical gender french i mean even the french has a neuter it's interesting where the, the french say it is hard for us to conceive a thing as an it we still think of it as he and she and in italian you have no neuter at all everything's masculine and feminine mm. Fascinating. Uh, yeah. So would you say that somebody needs uh, should have uh, to, to gain those concepts, would you suggest somebody use a traditional grammar text like Wheelock or, or something like that in order to, I to recommend that? Wheelock? Some people have made Wheelock work and it's fine and there's good text to get in, you know, to, to work off of to translate. But the problem with Wheelock, like as a text, you get one of the most important parts of Latin, the least understood parts for especially for Anglophones, is the subjunctive because our subjunctive is completely dropped out in, in the, the language use. So mm. uh, as a, in the lived experience of the language, as opposed to other, let's say German, for example, where it's still very strong. Um, the problem you run into there is that Wheelock doesn't even bring it in to like the last, it, it, once you're in the 30th chapters or so, I can't remember which one, and they only bring in these independent usage usages. They don't do very much with the most important part of the subjunctive, which is the sequence of tenses which is that when you make uh, various statements and you can connect it with a subjunctive clause with, a, with something say oot or use relative clauses or you use uh, any of the other um, you know particles used to the conjunctions used to make a subjunctive statement you, you the, the first phrase will be in the indicative and then the the um, causal the, the clause will actually be the next clause will be in the, the subjunctive right so which subjunctive you use, you have four tenses of the subjunctive, which one you're using is based on which indicative you're using. So if you have the present indicative or the future indicative, you're going to use the, the present subjunctive. Or if it's an antecedent clause, then it's happening prior to the indicative statement, you're going to use the perfect subjunctive. And then if you're making you know, the more historical use of the term, you're narrating history, your indicative clause in, in the imperfect or in the the uh, the perfect tense, your subjunctive will be imperfect subjunctive, or again, pluperfect subjunctive if it's the antecedent clause, right? That's just a, big, a lot of big grammar stuff. Yep. Wheelock really doesn't do a whole lot with that. You get one chapter in the sequence of tenses, and then you're not given very much. That's something that in your very early formative stages, you should be learning how to use. I mean, even Orberg brings it in later than I would bring it in um, myself, just, just to, for, in, in terms of like finding use of the language and uh, it still works. It still works just fine. But in terms of how you, that book ends up being taught, it's a drag. It takes a long time with students getting through because the temptation of the teacher, and this was certainly my fault, is you want to go so fast because you've already read this text a million times and you want to go so fast, but they're just not getting it. It's hard to slow down, go back and then have this carry on for years. And you're only in the, you know, the, the first 20 chapters of Warburg and you have to go back and review and the kids get tired of it. Mm -hmm. So there's and again, that's where the inventive and clever teacher comes in who's really able to, you know, make so much of this work and bring so much of this in. And you can even go ahead and bring in certain concepts, you know, and then 
unpack them more fully later. Warburg himself does that in the text. So, mm -hmm. you know, the subjunctive then is, you know, you can bring it in as early as chapter 22, you know, it, it just, uh, yeah, this means this and, but you don't really bring it up, but you know how to make use of that as a good teacher to then when it is brought in, okay, and this is what we we're talking about before. Mm -hmm. And then that gradually unfolds. And then you've got a good base to unfold it naturally. Um, other texts like Moreland and Flesher, Latin and intense, of course, they bring it in just a little too early in my opinion, because it's like in the first or second chapter, they, they bring it in. And although that's, you can still work with that. I mean, that's just, you know, you'll start learning how to use that very necessary part of the language earlier. But the trick is that like a lot of times the subjunctive, when you translate it, it's actually going to come like an English indicative. And that there's a phrase that, um, that Father Foster used to teach in Rome. He used to call it sounds indicative was his phrase. Right. So mm. not all subjunctives are contrary to fact conditions, implausibilities, which <clears throat> many of them are. And there's phrases for that. And there's, you know, there's ways they use it, you know, independent uses of the subjunctive and let us oremos versus oramos. We are praying oremos. Let us pray. And mm. that's the, you know, those are the more independent uses rather than as fixing all these more, you know, uh, clauses and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought up Father Foster there. He has a great book, uh, the the bare bones of Latin. I, I right. that's a that's a great one. Um, it's something I wanted to ask you. You, you mentioned all these these uh, these insights about the the grammatical structure of Latin. Do you think there's something about the Latin language itself that makes it more suited to theological and philosophical writings, or is that just a, um, a something that has happened? as a historical fact. Well, people were simply speaking Latin, and so that's why you have all of these the theological, philosophical tracts written in that language. Or do you think there's something about this language in particular that is more suited to those types of writings? It's a both and, I think. It, it, it's, it is part of history that the language of the empire becomes, <clears throat> that Latin, you know, develops itself in a more high, you know, um, high linguistic use during the silver and golden ages that is you know, <clears throat> right around cicero's time you know going through into the, the time of augustus which is called the golden age of latin um and you have virgil and you have horace uh, as these great poets i mean cicero is what they usually call the silver age unless i'm mistaken it's been a while since i went into these subjects but um and then you know it, it develops into this later Latin, which is the Latin of the Fathers, which is the exact same language as, as the Romans. It's just an adjustment of vocabulary. Ecclesiastical Latin is not some debased, you know, vulgar bathroom Latin, which is how it used to get mocked by classical, you know, especially classical humanists and, and people of that persuasion as late as the 19th century we hated Latin. Call it even uh, Forcellini, who is the editor of the the big dictionary of all Latin, really useful resource actually in general. But he looks at Latin from fourth and fifth century, calls it barbarous. And half the time it's, it's what it's perfectly fine. You could find similar uses even in Cicero. And what he's inveighing against is that general kind of a priori zeitgeist. Everything after this period is bad. Hmm. But you look at St. Augustine, you look at Boethius, right, yeah. you look at Ambrose, you look at Chrysol Peter Chrysologus, St. Gregory the Great. They're, they're all writing, you know, marvelously well in Latin. And so, I mean, Cicero could have understood Aquinas with a simple adjustment for vocabulary and te technical terminology. Hmm. And well, speaking, it is of, speaking of writing well in Latin, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about your, uh, your, your huge work, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, St. Robert Bellarmine. He, mm -hmm. he, the, the big uh, De Controversies uh, text, which, as you mentioned, over two million Latin words, what inspired you once you had a firm grasp of the Latin language to say, well, I want to get that whole thing translated. I want to embark on that journey. What inspired you to do that? One time I was uh, it's talking to a fraternity of St. Peter priest. He's not in the fraternity anymore, but uh, he didn't know Latin well enough to read it. And so he, so we were consulting about what Bellarmine said on various subjects. And when we got done, I was like, you know, it's a shame this is never translated. And then the idea came in my head, you know, oh, well, this would be a great idea to put it out. Now, as it turns out, when, when I got it, now when I got around to it, it was largely because I needed money. I was starting as new venture and I hadn't, there was a downturn in the economy and like to do the press was supposed to be a side gig instead became kind of the main thing. And so I was like, I need projects that can bring in some money. 
And so that's when I, you know, said on, oh, I want development. People are asking for that. People want that text. People will buy that. And so I did on the marks of the church, more or less as a proof of concepts. Like, all right, see, I can do this. If you don't believe I can do it, read the book. And then, you know, and then I got in earnest, I think, in the one on the Roman pontiff. Now, the first edition of that was full of so many errors because I couldn't afford the editing. So I tried to do it myself. And that was, I'm still embarrassed that I put it out. <laughs> and uh, luckily, I went back and cleaned it up. There's still some things to get fixed in it, but it's serviceable now, as opposed to when it came out. So now I have a paid editor that goes through things. I don't do that anymore. Thank goodness. Um, but the uh, what, what I did not know at the same time I was working on that is Father Kenneth Baker was also translating the controversies and he stopped because I was going and I think, you know, if only I knew that I would have done a different text because he could have banged that out faster and they'd all be done because he doesn't have children at the time. Uh, my late wife um, who died uh, last year, you know, all, all the travails of, of uh, family life, you know, in, mm. interfering with my ability to sit down and just go through the text and get it done. And so that at least it would all be done now <laughs> if I'd done that. Mm. So, um, you know, I don't have any particular hubris about it. It's just get it out. Let's get it done. Yeah. So it's it's unfortunate, but I got to keep going. And so I am trying to just finishing off the church triumph and waiting on a few sections for my editor. And then on the Eucharist, I think is my next uh, one to try to try to move that along. Um, and, and so, but that's, that's basically what inspired me to do. It's like, yeah, this thing should be out there. Why hasn't anybody done this? And of course, then when it does get out there, um, the only reason, like on the Roman Pontiffs, you know, it's a massive book. Uh, it's very, it's just 700 pages or so. And uh, people buy it because they want the those four or five pages in book two, chapter 30 on the whole question of a heretical pope. And then they do, they ignore the rest of the book. I'm like, yes, <laughs> it's full of so much, so many amazing things and so many great arguments and just, just deep, you know, deepens and, develops uh, your understanding of the theology, you know, and every, you know, you get to points where the back and forth with Calvin or with Bucer or, or Melanchthon or Luther, or whoever gets, you know, a bit tedious here and there, but in general, when you're reading it, it, it deepens your faith. It, like all really good theology as you're reading, it just deepens your faith. Like Cardinal Franzlin's another author that when you read his, I was reading his De Verbo Incarnato and I realized more than just, just theology, um, this is almost uh, mystical <laughs> in its uh, where in, in its reading. It, it's just uh, how the deep concepts that they're getting into, mm -hmm. which um, it's also you know the more amazing too is a lot of people want to be theologians. Everyone's a theologian, and then reading people like Bellarmine or Cardinal De Lugo or John of Saint Thomas, and then or more recently Cardinal you know Cardinal Franzlin, Colonel Dulo, um, you realize that uh, I'm not even a dust mite on the the fly that is on the midget standing on the shoulders of giants as mm. far as sacred theology goes. And so you step back and you're like, wow, it's just amazing that I've been allowed to even participate in this um, <laughs> in a sinful and worthless man as I am. Mm. So that's the uh, kind of, you know, but it, and it always, I'm always finding new things and I, I've read all of the controversies now, but some of it I kind of skimmed over to get a sense of what I'm in for. And uh, when we get mm. to this text or this one or, research a question. So there's areas like in justification and other places, I've kind of skimmed through it a little bit, but I haven't really read it all in depth. And when I do read it in depth, I always find new things, things that are, you know, just, just like, you just come away like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And I would agree with you. Every time I've read Bellarmine, it's terrifying because you realize, goodness gracious, the, just the fact that a man can be so holy, which shines through, but also so intelligent. It's quite astounding. Now I do want to get into more of those, uh, the, the deeper topics, but I do have to ask you about those limited amount of pages, because of course, uh, especially in recent times, um, the set of the contest question is coming back uh, into the, the common debate among traditionalists. Now, I, you still see it around. You'll see these pamphlets given out or things put online. You get those quotes from Bellarmine that, that it's, it's structured in a way that says, well, Bellarmine supported our position. He proves the set of a contest position and that he held the set of a contest position. Could you, for our audience, sort of break down uh, in, uh, briefly the, the, the five opinions that he gives? And could you tell us that... Uh, did he hold the do, do the set of a contest have a point in using him as their argument for set of a contism? I would say yes and no. Um, 
in as much as uh, one, he didn't believe it could ever happen. Mm. And, and so he, the opinion he adheres to is that the, the Pope will never become a heretic. And then he takes on the opinions of, well, what if he could? And then you have the second the opinion, which is that, um, <clears throat> you know, it'd be utterly and absolutely impossible for, um, I don't, I, you know, I haven't looked at it in such a long time, actually, because I've stepped so far away from that question. I've done other <laughs> things, but um, so it was a little bit embarrassing, but I'd have to go back and, and, and look at to get explicitly laid out, you know, but the Pope in no way can err. And he says, well, you have this canon, see Papa, which is what the, the question revolves around in canon law. And so it's, you know, various author, grave authors seem to think that, you, you know, he could, right? And then he gets to, you know, the, the third opinion, which makes a bunch of errors on, on some subjects. And he says, you know, um, you know, no, this can't be for these reasons. And then you get to the fourth opinion, which is Cajetans. And a lot of people misunderstand actually what Cajetan's getting at. And although he does, I mean, Cajetan does make some errors. Bellarmine does not, but people do today. Um, Cajetan's argument was, Yes, if the Pope becomes a heretic, then it's, and this is very much the Thomistic position, that you have to, that then it would have to it would come to the church, um, be, you know, to judge the Pope in this subject and, you know, have a council and depose him. So, you know, because St. Thomas says that uh, you can't blindly fall a prelate into error and, uh, you know, heresy is the only case where an inferior gets to judge a superior. So, you know, it's such a grave matter. And Bellarmine even, even quotes that in, in self, although from a different author, but uh, it's it, it becomes a problematic thing because Bellarmine like, finds the very problem with this whole notion. Well, if the council is judging a pope, and he is truly a pope by Cajetan's admission, how is he? How is the church not? How is this not conciliarism? How is it that you know the the, the, the council is judging a true pope? And some people read this to say that, okay, therefore, you know, no council is just by itself. It happens. And you know, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll revisit that in a minute. So Bellarmine, after refuting Cajun and basically showing, no, this is, this is conciliarism if you get to that argument. So what's the true story? So then he says, if it even could happen at all, this is what would happen, is that he would, you know, cease from the moment he became a manifest heretic. Now, when he says that word manifest, uh, hereticus manifest, uh, manifestus. It, it is a technical term in that time, basically for what today we would mean a formal heretic, basically somebody who denies a teaching that has the, the nota de fide, that is of the faith. It is, you know, every Catholic must believe this. And it's, which means it's taught by the extraordinary magisterium to use modern day terminology on it. It's taught by, you know, a solemn judgment of the Pope or by ecumenical councils whose uh, formal decrees and faith and morals have been ratified by a Pope. Things that, you know, in, 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 it's beyond doubt. These things, you know, it's obviously um, that Christ is truly God. And, you know, the assumption of Our Lady, at least now, in Bellarmine's time, it wasn't dogmatically defined, but I think you'd be considered a heretic if you denied it by the weight of the tradition. But uh, Mary, the mother of God, Right, teaching of Ephesus, where the Christ is one divine person with two natures, human and divine, and so on and so forth. So you denied those things, and uh, the Holy Trinity, and anything else that had been formally, you know, defined by the Church, you would be, you know, a heretic. But what about other things? So, like, if something is affixed with a note, uh, you know, Irenaea, which, uh, and you can review all these in Ludwig Ott. Uh, fundamentals of Catholic dogma, all the theological notes, if you want to get into them. But if it's Irenaea or uh, Temeritatis, a, no, a nota Temeritatis, a mark of rashness, it's a rash opinion, or offensive piatum aureum, most of what prelates say today, it falls under that category, um, you know, something of that sort, that would be, you know, if you denied something of that, it might indicate a heretical mindset but until it has been, you know, you get a clear statement that he denies this, you know, this formal teaching. I know the church teaches this, but I'm teaching this. You, it's not manifest at that point. And Bellarmine further distinguishes it, and I think it's in the third opinion, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Because third opinion, I, I skipped over it briefly, but it was basically even if a pope thinks something, you know, heretical, but it's never publicly out, he falls from the papal dignity. And Bellarmine says, well, that's not true. Because uh, occult heretics have always been held to be members of the church. 
So it has to be public and manifest. It can't be he himself is a heretic, but nobody hasn't pronounced on these points, even if you suspect him of being heretical, or he looks heretical, the, the, the thing he said here looks heretical, has to actually be. So in the second opinion, um, you know, he cites Torquemada uh, in, uh, in his major treatise on the church uh, for saying it, but as Bellarmine says, this doesn't seem right, you know, because, you know, a secret heretic you know, is still a member of the church and doesn't seem to be false. So that's the one whom he cites on that. And the third opinion, however, is that neither through secret heresy nor through manifest heresy um, is he deposed nor nor may he be deposed. And mm. so, um, and, you know, he goes on about this and how this is false because the, um, you know, the, the Eighth Council recites the acts whereby uh, Honorius was condemned under a council from the, the, uh, under, under Pope Adrian. Now he does stop and he says, now we don't think that Honorius was really condemned, but just the same, the fact that this condemnation was renewed and popes reviewed it at Rome shows that it can be done, right? So that's an interesting thing, um, <clears throat> you know, altogether, because otherwise we'd be, you know, compelled to acknowledge a wolf as a shepherd if it was impossible right. for the Pope, you know, to be deposed even for you know, manifest heresy, right? And, and that's that's the third opinion, that it's impossible for him to be deposed in any way for any anything at all, that it's impossible for this to come about. And we'll get to the deposition issue, you know, uh, again in a minute. And then it comes to catch. And so, this, so just to review, so the first opinion is it'll never happen. Second opinion is that uh, even if it's a secret, you know, heresy, he just thinks contrary to the church, but he never publishes it, um, you know, then, then he's declared to be deposed by divine law uh, by that fact, um, you know, if he refuses to yield. And, and so, and Bellarmine, you know, cites Torquemada for that. And he says, well, this is not true because, you know, the foundation of this opinion, Bellarmine says, is that heret, you know, heretics, secret heretics are outside the church, but that is false. And we'll show this more in the treatise in the church, he goes on. Then the third opinion, yeah, there's no way to get rid of him if he is a heretic, which people hold today. People say that, yeah, he, he, even if he is a heretic, you can't get rid of him. Uh, there's people of that persuasion. Of course, generally what they really say is that, well, Vatican I, the Pope can't be a heretic, period. It can just not happen as Vatican I declared it, which is not actually true when you get to Vatican I. It doesn't do that. So, mm -hmm. and that's the thing. So the true opinion, according to Bellarmine in the fifth opinion, is that, you know, in his own person, he ceases to be Pope the moment that, uh, you know, he, you know, declare, he publicly professes manifest heresy, defy, denies something, it is de fide, and it's clear there's, there's no question about it. And, and like I said, with regard to, I'll leave to competent theologians the questions of the popes since John the 23rd and let the, you know, other people make the judgment on that. But that's what Bellarmine says. Now, when you get in his book on councils, which is in the next volume, is on the church. Uh, my volume, I think that's volume three, my renumbered volumes. So the one on councils, book one, chapter nine. Um, after reviewing, you know, again, the, again, attacking the errors of conciliarism, then, you know, Bellarmine poses the question, well, if the Pope is supreme in all his judgments, if the Pope, you know, can simply rule without, you know, and issue decrees and settle controversies, and he doesn't need a council for that technically, what do you need a council for? And he reviews various reasons, one for the, the utility in terms of the, the unity of the church, that everyone is seen to be a part of the church's teaching and whatnot, but also, more specifically, that it, it enumerates one of their jobs is to depose a heretical pope. Doesn't that go against what he said in Book 2, Chapter 3? Well, it doesn't, and here's why. In his treatise on the pope, he's dealing with the pope ex parte pape. It is on the side of the pope. And so, yeah, on the side of the Pope, he ceases to be Pope the minute he publicly, you know, declares something contrary to a de fide doctrine of the church. But on the side of the church, you still need a, you know, some kind of sentence, a declaratory sentence of some form. And and then that, you know, that, that settles all doubts, removes all question. And then, you know, you declare it by divine law himself, by itself. It's not the council's declaration that's done it. It's by divine law itself. And Suarez says the same thing. And in his treatise, De Sumo uh, uh, Pape, uh, and 
he uh, when, when then there's another it's a bit of an open dictum, but at the same time, it bears on the question. Same book on councils, book one, chapter 21, reviewing the reasons why the Lutherans say they won't go to the Council of Trent. And one of them says, well, the Pope doesn't have any right to call people to a council. And then Bellarmine adds, well, if that is so, how can how can you deny this unless the Pope had first been declared deposed by a, 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 some kind of council or by the world's mm -hmm. bishops? And so, namely, that once that happens, then it's clear on the side of the church that there's no authority remaining to this guy, whatever. So... Bellarmine clearly sees the involvement of the church. He also says something even more uh, outrageous for Sedevacantus in that same book on councils. He says the dignity and authority of councils is so great that if you had a council of fake bishops that looked like bishops outwardly, but actually in reality were not bishops, and you had a fake pope who's not a real pope, even then, Bellarmine says, they could not err positively against the faith. Because, you know, that, that you know, the, the Holy Spirit guiding the church couldn't allow that to happen, such as the dignity and authority of councils. And he adds a position that is, again, pretty much constant in all theologians prior to Vatican II, which is the entire hierarchy cannot defect. Right. If I'm not mistaken in understanding what um, our set of Acantus brothers say, they're basically at Vatican II. The entire church defected, at the very least, at Vatican II. The entire church acknowledging a guy who, in their their estimation of it, was not a real pope, and then his successor who was not a real pope, and all you know defect and sign documents which they say are heretical, absolutely in all their and they may be, I don't know. <laughs> I'll let the theologians work that out. Um, mm -hmm. I won't deny you, there's problematic things that I find very troubling in Vatican II. But again, I'm going to prescind from the theological judgment because I shouldn't be making theological judgments like that. So, but the entire hierarchy would have defected throughout the world, mm. and that's you know to me a, a troubling thing. And so, and that's something that Bellarmine would not believe could ever have happened. And then you know, so then the question is, okay, so we're going to look and say, well, he looks like a heretic, sounds like a heretic, therefore he must be a heretic. And so we're just going to recognize the fact of it, they say, and say, yeah, he's not really the Pope. We don't, we're just going to set up our chapels and continue, you know, say, hey, you recognize and resist people. You know, if you can just resist whatever the Pope says, you know, why do you even have a Pope? We can turn all this around. If for 70, going on 70 years now, there is no Pope, um, and you just, we can set up our chapels and consecrate bishops from uh, from a guy who reconciled with the Pope after Assisi, by the way, Archbishop Thuc. Um, you want to talk about, you know, Episcopal lines being tainted, which is one argument mm. they come up with for other, uh, you know, Episcopal lines. It's like, well, how about that one? <laughs> which is from, from where Sanborn descends. Um, if that's the case, what do we need a Pope for? If we can set up our chapels and we can, you know, continue to offering mass, oh, well, eventually God will sort it out. In the meantime, we're just going to continue instead of a and just keep going. Uh, it's just, just a recognition of reality. We're not judging anything. All right, fine. I'll grant that. But what do we need the Pope for? If we can do that for 70 years and it's not resolved. So so what I would say ultimately, and, and I, I know a lot of set of and I'm friends with them. I get it. I really, really do. And, I, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I don't like to drum up more of the divisions because we have so many of them and the endless circular firing squad on the platform formerly known as Twitter or <laughs> Fedbook or face, that is Facebook, I call it, uh, <laughs> Fedbook, or any other social media space or in print where the, the circular firing squad is ongoing. Um, I don't think that's useful or beneficial to the church. I think ultimately... You know, they, they've they made this determination, okay, the, the, well, he's saying these things that are crazy, because we're all dealing with this crisis, where we have the uh, members of the hierarchy and the, the magisterium teaching things that when we look back at the received tradition, they don't add up. They do not seem to be what the church has always and ever were taught, or in demonstrable cases are clearly opposed to what the church has always and ever believed in, um, you know, minor greater statements and encyclicals. And yeah, by what we've been given, that shouldn't be able to happen, but it is. And so one response is to do like the set of a cancer set. Now 
I do not believe that Bellarmine ever envisaged something like you see with any set of Acantus movement today. Maybe Cassiacum thesis, um, but certainly not with the totalists. And because Bellarmine recognized, yeah, at least if, if this happened, then this is what would follow in the fifth opinion. But he also saw the entire participation of the church because it's guided by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not going to allow a situation destructive to souls to, to go on indefinitely as it seems to be going on. So, you know, there has to be, and that's why, again, he sees the, the participation of all the bishops in a council to, you know, declare by divine law the Pope has been deposed because that, you know, that would, that would be what was needed in such a case. And because the Holy Spirit is, it's not just a work of men at that point, because there's always going to be some guy looking for favors, looking to kowtow to the, uh, you know, to whichever, you know, the, the heretical Pope in question, you know, hoping to advance somehow. So a council would be the work of the Holy Spirit in that case, right? And so it's not just, so yeah, you could not get all the, you know, the bishops of the world to come together and declare a Pope deposed, but the Holy Spirit can. And so and that's what the kind of situation Bellarmine foresees. And I would find it very hard to believe that Bellarmine imagined that the, the systems of the church and that the, uh, you know, the church's divine mission could continue for going on a century with no actual pope. Um, that doesn't seem now, that's my opinion, that's my judgment. I'm not saying that is what, you know, because there's not a spot I've seen in Bellarmine where he clearly says that. But based on, you know, his love for the church and his fear for in various, you know, controversies when, um, you know, with popes where he was terrified that the pope might err, he's, you know, he seemed to see resolution to these things would have to come relatively quickly, such as in the, the controversy um, on this, the, the Vulgate, right, with Sixtus V, um, the Papa uh, Terrible, right, he had a horrible temper. Uh, Cardinal Maldonado Franciscan became Sixtus V. And, you know, he was a decent scholar, not a great scholar, but he overestimated his scholarly abilities and he figured he could get the whole Vulgate revised. So he threw out the entire work of the Vulgate Commission established by Trent, which Bellarmine had worked on with the Jesuit Salmeron and many others, and just started, just started doing the work himself. And it ended up being a huge problem. Uh, not unlike my first uh, edition on the Roman Pontiff, when you try to do too much on your own, <laughs> distracted by so many things. And uh, and so there's whole sections of scripture omitted. Nothing that really bore on faith and morals. Uh, I've seen the, the original sixth to the fifth Vulgate. And it, it is a bit of a train wreck, though, because of so many problems and whatnot. And then as soon as it's getting ready for, the, for it to be printed, then he'd call it back for more changes. And there's all these little bits of plaster putting in new corrections and whatnot over it. Mm. And, and Bellarmine was away when this is going on. He's in France on a diplomatic mission uh, because of the civil wars in France. One of the other things that happens too is Bellarmine actually gets put on the index because uh, sixth to the fifth, who was a canonist, all his canonist friends really did not like uh, Bellarmine's teaching in book five of On the Roman Pontiff, where he argues that the Pope does not have direct power or temporal power, only indirect for the sake of the faith. And it was the current among candidates at that point that the Pope actually is the king of the world and everyone's his vassal. And Bellarmine shows in the base of the fathers and the scholastics that that's not the case. So mm. that got him into more trouble, I think, than any other book of his in his entire life, frankly. And, uh, mm. and that, that was constantly a thing that would come up with the candidates. But so they eventually prevailed upon six to the fifth to put him as well as uh, Francisco Victoria on the index. And I've seen oh. it in Rome. It's uh, on page 17. It's uh, numbered only on the odd pages. And uh, it says, you know, Robert Bellarmine, Francisco Victoria, for certain statements on the temporal authority of the Pope, it cites which books were the problem until these things should be corrected. Well, Sixth of the Fifth died in a few weeks later, and then that was immediately taken off. <laughs> oh, wow. Because it was known in most currents held the Pope was making a grave mistake with that action. The Vulgate hmm. was another one. And he was just trying to push this thing through. And uh, finally, it's like close to done. The, 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 the bull of promulgation goes up, but the books never go out because he dies. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the next pope come in, the next popes come in. There's like three popes who die in quick succession until you get to Clement VIII. It says, let's get this train wreck fixed. And, and Bellarmine's clear both in letters and his writings to um, uh, the Jesuit Superior Aquaviva that they, this was the closest the papacy ever came to erring 
And, and that's, that's, he really believed that. The next question was on efficacious grace, where again, he thought Clement VIII was going to pronounce against the Jesuits. And he was very much worried about that. The whole controversy between Banyas and Molina on, uh, you know, which goes into different discussions on grace and free will. And that ended up being another one of those little things. Bellarmine was convinced that if, if Clement VIII was, you know, my heir, because this is not because he, and he didn't hold to Molina's position either. Bellarmine was critical of Molina just as he was of Banyas. So he was uh, more worried that this is such an inscrutable, difficult question. Trying to make a formal judgment on it is going to lead the church into error. And if we, you know, and that, that would be disastrous also. So, but he had such humility that, you know, because the Pope knew, you know, Bellarmine was critical of him. This is when he was a cardinal. And so Clement VIII decides to, be, to show his displeasure by banishing Bellarmine to uh, the Diocese of Capua as its new bishop. Bellarmine has gone in 30 days because I mean, <laughs> he hated being a cardinal. But mm. bishop, that's the apostolic office. This is what I should be doing. I feel like I'm a, a, an actual minister of God again <laughs> and, and sort of a, a prince of the church where he, he was deathly afraid he, he'd lose his soul. You look in uh, Bachelet, uh, Javier-Marie Bachelet, the uh, French uh, Jesuit, and he, uh, you know, collected all these letters, all these things, and I've got all those volumes. And you go through those, and Bellum is terrified. <laughs> he's going to lose his soul by being a cardinal. Bishop, no, that's an apostolic labor. I can do that. And he's gone in 30 days and uh, never looked back on that controversy again. Various Jesuits asked him to get into it. He said, no, I have a diocese to look after. And he threw himself all into that. So his humility, even as fearful as he was, I mean, he wrote a letter to Clement VIII. I've actually held the original letter. It's in the Vatican. And he... Uh, He's afraid that Clement VIII is getting false notions of what Pelagianism actually was, and and that he's inculcating this to Molina's position. Which, as much as Bellarmine disagreed with Molina's position, it wasn't Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism. Mm. And so he was writing this letter to try to lay down from St. Augustine and the ancient authorities what Pelagianism actually was and how it differs from the view now current in so many sectors of the, the Society of Jesus. And he lays these things out in his, his hit pen strokes. Are, it doesn't come out in the text as it does when you see the original letter. It's very belabored. Like he's writing at night by candlelight, fearful for what will happen if he doesn't get this letter out. It's like an it is, you know, his duty as a cardinal, as a theologian, to write this to the Pope, to give him this advice. That, you know the Pope's mind was made up to pronounce on the side of the of, uh, Banyas, mm. which never happened. Uh, Clement VIII actually died before the question was ever settled. And then Pope Paul V became Pope again, and it recalls Bellarmine, asks Bellarmine's opinion, and he says, well, this is what the commission came up with. This is what we should do. Don't decree anything. Just, just you know, put imposed respectful debate on the subject no side calls the other heretical and we'll move on peace is restored and uh you know and that's where we are today on that question um even though you'll you know, although now i see a lot more thomas that want to say that the molina's position is heretical i do think it's problematic i don't think it's heretical but anyway i did want to um, ask you about that about the um the, the thomist note and yeah you're right i mean you 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 do read a lot more thomas will just say we need to condemn molina something i i wanted to ask you about of course saint robert bellerman was a played a big role for my understanding in bringing the summa to the the forefront of of, of Catholic mm -hmm. thought, and you see it throughout your translation. He's um he's he's quoting Saint Thomas Aquinas, but I've also noticed he quotes Saint Bonaventure as well. What I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you is, do you think it's fair to label Saint Robert Bellarmine as a Thomist? Do you think he falls into any of these schools uh, in a in a way where you'd be comfortable labeling him one of these, or is he something uh, all on on his own? None of these labels really fit him. For our terms, we can call him a Thomist. Uh, and now the provenance of the term Thomista actually comes from the whole controversy I just mentioned between Banyas and Molina. Mm -hmm. And so the Dominicans with their position, or Banyas's position, which largely became a Dominican position with, um, you know, Banyas's teaching. Banyas argues this goes right back to St. Thomas. So they call themselves Thomists to argue that, that this doctrine on grace is the proper Thomistic position. Now, Bellarmine disagreed with that very virulently. He offered to debate anyone to show that this was not actually Thomas's position. Now, this was uh, in terms of the first grace that is applied to move the soul. Uh, there is a premotia, premotia physica. There is a, a physical premotion that basically renders that the effect of that grace will infallibly follow. Now, for Bellarmine, this looked like Calvinism. 
that basically said that that if the will is in, in, unable to resist, it will infallibly follow. That means that there's no freedom for the will to reject it. And therefore, how do you escape Calvinism? That was Bellarmine's complaint of it. I, fortunately, I, I'm not, again, I'm not a qualified theologian to jump into the theology of grace and tell you which one is correct. And I'm sure mm -hmm. that the um, there's there's Thomas today who will come out and, and respond, oh, no, well, we got the answer to that. Maybe they do. And that's fine. Gary Lagrange held this position very much, uh, every bit as yeah. much as Banyas did. Molina argued that the will you know is so sufficiently free it can easily reject the first grace and so it's embrace is more of an act of love and that and so and, and that's problematic on its way and there's other things in molinism to get into that i just don't really properly get and so i'm not going to try to labor the you know bring these out without you know um you know, like like to say to the you know the priest before he gets to the pulpit, sorry, Father, you're limited to five heresies a day, <laughs> yeah, or five heresies per sermon, right? You know, I'm going to get in that territory if I really try to draw these out. So Bellarmine was what you call a congruist, and his position is actually much closer to Banyas's than it is to Molina's. And congruism essentially says that the first grace will infallibly it will infallibly obtain its effect within the circumstances whereby it's given, and that but in other circumstances it may not. And they, that the, the circumstances are de congruis, right? They, they, they're, they're suited, they're fitting, congruent, if you wanted to take the cognate. And and that was, and that was, he held that long before this particular debate came up when he published De Grazia. Uh, that's the position he has, and he bases it on St. Augustine and St. Thomas. And so that's essentially, you know, how he comes down on that subject. So in the Ratio Studiorum of the Jesuits, which he, in Aquaviva, the superior general and, and Suarez and, and many other learned Jesuits had worked on, uh, you know, fame, other famous names like the moral theologian Azor. Um, I was just trying to think of some other people. Uh, Anthony Passavino, I'm pretty sure had something in, involvement there. Um, some other Jesuit names that were involved with that. St. Thomas is taken to be the rule in the model, right? Now, sometimes when you see like a description of Thomas in, the, in those times, they'll talk about Suarezian Thomism as like a distinct branch and, and, and it really it should be Suarez or Suareziatism that you talk about because that you know Suarez is distinct in his understanding of Thomas even from other Jesuits and so I would not rate uh, you know like they say all the Jesuits followed Suarezian Thomism that's actually not true uh, by, a, by a long shot but Suarez definitely has his own interpretation of St. Thomas which differs from Bellarmine's which differs from you know other theologians in the society, and so and it was within a certain freedom. Because in those days, there you had the you wouldn't take any man as, as your master per se, not not even Peter Lombard, not even Aquinas. Uh, yet Saint Thomas still had that pride of place, and that you know in, in in other theological works that are meant for Catholics. See, Bellarmine doesn't quote the Scholastics that often in the controversies, except where it's a point where they're alleging St. Thomas or attacking St. Thomas, and Bellarmine feels the need to defend them, or again, when something St. Thomas said bears on the matter and, and shows the encapsulation of this came from the fathers, because his real provenance is the fathers, and that that argument is that's where he's going to, is, is the fathers for in the scripture. So this, the scholastics are secondary because apart from a handful of Protestants, they all rejected them. So there's no point in arguing from the scholastics. So mm -hmm. when you get to the you know debates within Catholic circles and other, other things that Bellarmine is writing, and you see it in his work in the Holy Office, you see it in other books that he wrote, he'll go back to St. Thomas. Because again, as you see it in the Ratio Studiorum, which he contributes to, Thomas is taken again as the model. And in a way where it's, it's sometimes it's said like St. Thomas has this line that Augustine took what was good from the pagans and uh, it removed what was bad. Um, I believe unless I'm mistaken, as John of St. Thomas says that uh, St. Thomas Aquinas actually you know, epitomizes that far better than Augustine does. Mm -hmm. And he really is. The, the, there's a reason why he's the universal doctor. But what about this or that system of Thomism? And then we might, especially if you're looking at Thomism as it was in books prior to Vatican II, um, with exceptions that stand out like below and, and, and Lagrange go beyond it. You're talking about Neo-Thomism, which is a movement that comes from Kloitgen, which is um, partly restoring St. Thomas to the pride of place because the 18th century had really diminished um, in, in Thomas's universal appeal that he'd had in the 16th and 17th centuries. The 18th century 
you know, you get the Enlightenment's going on. Catholics are influenced by the Enlightenment. There, there's thinkers and philosophers going in in different ways. So in the 19th century, you know, Cloykin's part of the, this group in the Roman College to restore the focus and primacy on St. Thomas. And so one of his students, uh, the future Leo the Thirteenth, becomes Pope and then uh, publishes Attorney Patris on the subject of St. Thomas as a universal doctor. But he doesn't lay down, okay, but this, because yeah, then the next question is, what is Thomism? And I am not a brilliant enough Thomist or philosopher to get in and define that for you because the Thomists themselves disagree on it. So I, I can't come in and, and settle that debate. Uh, really, in my powers in philosophy are better suited to a historian of philosophy rather than an arguer of it. So I wouldn't want to step into those grounds to step on people's toes and, again, make a whole bunch of errors on uh, <laughs> various matters. Um, like sometimes you get in a Thomist forum and they're talking about some complicated thing in cosmology or metaphysics, by which I mean ontology, not not physics cosmology. And it um, and, and it's it just that that's beyond me. I, I can't. I, I remember what St. Thomas taught on these subjects, but getting into that and arguing that directly, that's definitely a step uh, out, out of my wheelhouse, as it were. So really, when you get down to, you know, Thomism in the 16th century is we are following St. Thomas, we're looking at his principles, and we are developing them further and applying the principles of Thomas to new problems, just as Thomas applied the fathers and texts he thought were from the fathers and, and Augustine, especially in, in, in Aristotle and reason to all these various problems. So mm. again, just progressing the, the work of theology and philosophy and because he was such a universal master of everything combined with holiness, that's why he's the universal doctor of the church. But Bellarmine has that holiness too. And you see it in his later life where he's, somebody has to fetch him and he's praying the rosary, but he takes no notice, Bellarmine takes no notice of the sermon. He's just kind of walking mm -hmm. back and forth. And at, at a certain point, you know, he's like, well, the servant's like, how long do I got to wait here? You know, it <laughs> um, checks his, Baroque sundial or whatever, uh, as it in your watches. <laughs> but it's just, it's taking a bit of time. And so finally he decides after a pace of about 20 minutes, the Cardinal still has not noticed him. And finally he, he nervously touches, and these are in the canonization documents for Bellarmine, by the way. Um, he touches the Cardinal and, and then he, he looks frightened like a child that wakes from sleep and then, and then recovers himself. He, he comes to, as it were. It's a sign of transforming union in mystical theology to have that, mm. that type of thing. And so he had, you know, such a great, and that's why Bellarmine had such an, an aversion to possessions, to dignities, to titles. He joined the Jesuits specifically because they take vows not to seek higher office. Mm. And it was against his will that he was made a cardinal. He did not want to be made a cardinal. As I mentioned already how much he hated it. When Pope Clement VIII, uh, then the news struck him while he was working in the, the, the sacred penitentiary in the Vatican. And then he heard the report that he was going to be made a cardinal. And then he found out it was true. And so he, he begs everyone around him that he says, my soul is in danger. You need to help me find a way out of this. <laughs> and he, <laughs> Tries by every means, and then finally, when he's brought into consistory, he gets down on his knees before Clement VIII and begs him not to make, not to go through with it. And, and Clement orders him to stand up and receive the cardinal upon pain of my extreme displeasure, as in I might suspend you or excommunicate mm. you or something if you don't take this. And so he had no, wow. no further recourse. And then he's writing letters. All right, I, I've, I've structured my household in such a way. I only have so many servants. He's writing Cardinal Baronius for advice because Baronius is in a similar situation. Baronius just wanted to be writing, you know, doing scholarly work and praying and giving alms to the poor and taking his turn cooking in the, in the oratory. He did not want to be a cardinal. And yet was forced in by, a, he was forced to be Clement's confessor after Philip Neri died. And then... Um, you know, Clement VIII liked him so much. I'm going to make you a cardinal. No, 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 your holiness. Why do you hate me? <laughs> Don't make me a cardinal. And Bellarmine and Baronius were extremely good friends and very, wow. very, you know, close both before and after Bellarmine was made a cardinal. So they worked together in their various congregations, uh, reforming the liturgy, reforming the breviary. You know, it's Bellarmine is looking at these ancient offices in the in the Missal and breviary, and then saying, well, these things are added to this office. The office is old, but 
these little collects are, are definitely later. And this one just defies reason. Like he gets to St. Petronilla, who's supposed to be the daughter of St. Peter by tradition. And then, you know, he says, and the story is that, that a Roman proconsul was so inflamed with love for her. And Bellarmine just stops and says, if we follow the chronology of the, of the times correctly, she would have been a 60 year old woman by this point. So he had a proconsul. <laughs> you want to tell me a proconsul is inflamed with love for her? So that whole uh, office of lessons went out the window. Um, other saints that were, you know, and then he looks at, uh, he was very critical of um, the way Eastern, uh, you know, church would have a given figure that's a saint in like, and Bellarmine's looking copiously through all these Greek manuscripts or all these texts. He can't find any evidence that this guy ever did anything except sit at the council and therefore was put on a, on a calendar of veneration. And, and so he, whenever he finds things like that in the Latin church, he tries to get rid of them <laughs> as much as he can. Also reforms like the Benedictine breviary, which I use today. Bellarmine actually helped to reform it and to protect it. It's because there was a like after quote pre, after quad nobis, which is the companion brief or sorry, bull to uh, quote primum. It has the exact same language, by the way. And uh, there was this kind of mania in the congregation of rites of taking all the breveries of the religious orders and making them more like the Roman rite as much as they could. Mm. So it's a they would appeal to Bellarmine to help protect them, and Bellarmine would use his influence to keep the various characters. The monastic office is able to keep its psalter and its character, you know, through Bellarmine's influence. Um, the uh, Norbertine breviary uh, was kept, and so the Norbertines thank Bellarmine by putting out a version of his sermons that he preached in Leuven after his death. So they were so thankful for how he had uh, protected their liturgy and breviary from the Romanizing trend going on in the Congregation of Rites. So wow. A lot, of, a lot of interesting little details there. And it, it just takes a lot to get into the weeds because all these documents are in Latin or in Italian or in French. Mm. And that goes back to why I suppose Latin is such an important thing to learn nowadays because all of this is, of course, uh, accessible really only through that. It's uh, something else I wanted to ask. You mentioned earlier about the um, uh, Bellarmine's political beliefs and how he was, uh, as you mentioned, even uh, the, the index was brought in. You, I, I've, I'm sure you've seen this nowadays, but oftentimes when it's monarchism and republicanism is brought up, the St. Robert Bellarmine is mm -hmm. mentioned. And I've seen him often used to defend the American political system. They'll say, well, this is actually the, the American foundation is quite close to what St. Robert Robert Bellarmine uh, would have wanted. Do you think, of course you can't speak for Bellarmine, but do you think that uh, St. Robert Bellarmine would have approved for how the American political system was set up? And what in general were his political beliefs? Well, Bellarmine was not a political philosopher. For him, all things were in service of theology. So the only reason he delves into politics at all one would have been when he was taking his degrees to deal with politics and Aristotle, and two, to deal with the Anabaptists, who denied all political authority as, as such, that there could be such all political authority is evil and wrong and by necessity of servitude. And he uh, is anti-authoritarian as I am. I, I don't go quite so, so far, but because it's contrary to scripture, <laughs> among other things. So one of the things that that happens in defending that then he has to delve into the origins of political authority and really all he's doing is repeating saint thomas all he's doing is repeating you know other authors there's nothing particularly if you want to get to good political theories you really should go to suarez because he fleshes all this stuff out bellarmine's largely just giving a principle and he's laying down the nature of political authority and so this term is used to describe a popular sovereignty that is the origin of political authority, which is ultimately when people live together in society, there has to be some rule or government or plan by which people are organized. And so the people will transfer their right to a ruler or system of rule of some kind. And then once that transfer has been made, as far as Bellarmine's concerned, the, you know, they don't, um, you know, they, they lose, they, they become true subjects now. They, they no longer have the right to take it back and just change it. But he does that. It seems though that since it, you know, political authority originated with the people that for just and grave reasons, they can take it back. So later on, when he gets in his pamphlet war with King James, he actually retreats from that position and may, lays it out very clear. All I wanted to do was deal with the origin of political authority. I did not mean to san sanction rebellion. I mentioned other authors, but I didn't necessarily approve of them. I was just citing opinions that were out there. And he makes it positive and clear to King James. Once the people have given up, you know, trans established the edifice of the political structure of the state, 
then you know truly like substance and accident the people are to the ruler and and so it's the, they are the people and he's the ruler and there's there's you know no way to change that you know except probably for just and grave reasons but he wouldn't admit rebellion at least whether that was just for the purposes of arguing james or he was backtracking altogether on the notion of it un unclear and the things that they're talking about are a hundred are in a completely different world from what later 18th century discussions in the united states or in france are about and so when you look closely at, at the, I wrote actually a series of articles that Catholic Family News has on their website. You, know, you want to get more in detail with this. Uh, I call it the, the Bellarmine Jefferson legend, of course, you know, this myth that, that Jefferson read all this Bellarmine, or he read it cited in Robert Filmer's Patriarcha and said, wow, this Bellarmine guy is right. It inspired him to write the mm -hmm. Declaration of Independence. It's completely false. It's nonsensical. Uh, it rests on pure conjecture. It was created, it's an idea created by the Jesuits back around the turn of the, the 20th century, around the same time they created the George Washington conversion myth, which again is another myth that rests upon zero testimony and zero evidence and you know, a witness testimony from 150 years later <laughs> or 120, <laughs> whatever it was at the time. Um, it's just not, it's not, none of it's plausible, but there's a purpose to it, you know, especially for the Jesuits in Georgetown and you know, there, there's a, because you have American Catholicism in, in the person of say Dagger John, Bishop John Hughes of New York. It's this militant, and I don't mean physically militant, but spiritually militant. We are going to convert the whole world. We're going to convert the Congress and the, and the armed forces and the president to the Catholic faith and be a, be a true Catholic Republic. We're going to convert Europe. We're going to convert Britain. We're going to convert all the nations. Catholicism, was, as Hughes says, will conquer all nations. And then you got people who are a little bit embarrassed by that, like Bishop Ireland in St. Paul, yeah. Minnesota. And he's very embarrassed by the fact. He's embarrassed by parochial schooling. He's embarrassed by the idea that Catholics would dare to stand out from this great American experiment, which they should all be part of. Now, it's one thing to love your country, and be patriotic, and also recognizing your country's flaws is also patriotic, in, in as much as, in as it, which is the right of a citizen to recognize the flaws in his country. And there's this attitude, well, you don't like it, go to England, go wherever. What about making our country better? You know, it's and so, mm -hmm. and I don't, but I don't want to jump into the hyper anti-Americanism, and the at least in terms of its foundation or its notion or the land that gave us birth anyway. I don't want to jump into that, but to get it really truly, Catholics are in a certain sense, you know, uh, foreigners as they are in, in the entire world, and you know, the United States is not a Catholic nation. So you look at Bellarmine again in in the rest of the treatise where he enunciates these various political principles, De Laicis. Um, and, the, and, and the last chapter of the book is on the need to burn heretical books and suppress freedom of speech. So American, <laughs> who would have thought? Right. Um, yes. You know, I mean, Jefferson ever vented. He would have got to that part and said, well, enough of these stuffy Jesuits. We're not doing that. Um, it, it just doesn't work. And the whole notion of, you see, you know, the church is like, the, you know, the, the you know, the, the three branches of government and, and the, you have the church and you have bishops and you have cardinals because Bellarmine lays out an argument, which is a f an argument for monarchy in the very opening uh, chapters of On the Roman Pontiff, like the first seven chapters or so are on. Monarchy is the best system of government. And why? Why democracy is positively the worst and republicanism mixed and usually ineffectual. And then he goes, you know, further because in his point is Calvin earlier on argued that uh, republicanism was the best form of government and, and aristocracy, not monarchy. And so, it, and that's of course to support his notions of presbyters councils who, you know, together, you know, exercise the power over the word of God and they exercise for Calvin, a sort of magisterium. They're the ones who bind you to the interpretation, understanding of the word of God. You know, the, the idea of like, you say like you're, you're Baptist, you're fundamentalist, you know, that, that said, oh, just me and my Bible. Calvin would have had nothing to do with that position. He would have anathematized you. That's not, you know, the, the, the notion of the teaching office of the church as far as Calvin understands it. But it's the presbyter's councils, which is why he has to argue for aristocracy being the best form of government which puts him at odds with the entirety of the, the tradition from not just from the Greeks, but also the church fathers and everything else. And so Bellarmine responds again by showing monarchy is the best system of government, but because the conditions of this world um, would not allow for a pure and unmixed monarchy, you have to have a mixed form of government, or as I translated there, a tempered form of government. So you have monarchy that is tempered with, 
aristocracy and likewise tempered with democracy. And, th and that would be, according to the ancients, there's some elements of each system in the whole monarchy. And that, therefore, is the church, he says. So that, you know, that you have the monarch who's truly the king. He is where the buck stops, as it were, to, to in, employ the modern parlance. And then you have, you know, the, the bishops who are true aristocrats, they, in a sense that they are true, like, lords and, and owners of their temporal seat. And then you have the element of democracy, which is anyone can be drawn up into any of these offices from the Christian people. And, of course, obviously, yes, he means men, men, average men laboring away, you know, and you have popes who came from very poor backgrounds, um, you know, not a whole ton, especially during various periods of the church. But more recently, St. Pius X was uh, a farm boy from a very poor family. And mm -hmm. just by his holiness and virtue and, and God's grace and, and election, rose in, until he was cardinal archbishop and then elected pope. So that yeah. is one of the, you know, the ways that the democracy, the democratic element enters the church, that anybody can be part of this aristocratic and monarchical system. But a monarchy, you know, you know the pope is only one judge, and that's God. The, you know, and so the United States employs uh, a different system which, you know, makes you, which is basically modeled on English law. And it's basically reinventing England. So we have a revolution from England by recreating England to be more suitable to the local elites over here rather than over there. Or as one historian puts it, Americans took on uh, heavy taxes to finance their war against taxation without representation and never paid taxes as low as they did prior to the revolution. And the author is pro-revolution, by the way. But he's just noted it's a fact of history. We paid fewer taxes prior to the American Revolution than after. And so mm -hmm. the, the, what's the raison d'etre of it? Um, and it's essentially the, the notion of local elites in, in Virginia, in the House of Burgess, in New England, that we can run the country better than the parliament over there. And on top of that, you have King George, who's trying to undo as much as he can the revolution of 1689, the so-called Glorious Revolution. Mm -hmm. And that made Parliament supreme. And the king is trying to re... And, and then his uh, heirs, King George, who was German, didn't want anything to do with the rule of England. And uh, even before him, William, William of Orange, when he's uh, William III, they have to give concessions, Dutch holdings around the world, the power of the king in this realm or in this one, is concessions to Parliament for Parliament to grant new taxes and levies of troops to go fight William's wars and later Anne's and then George's against the French in the continent and so power of the english monarch goes down it is it is very weak george the third is the first uh, monarch since anne that spoke english as a first language and it was it was because uh, uh, george the first and george the second they they always spoke german they refused to speak english george the third speaks it fluently and he considers himself properly speaking english rather than hanoverian it's a new thing mm -hmm. for the georges and he wants to recover a lot of this power. So, and that's the genesis essentially for the American Revolution, not slavery, not, um, you know, not merely taxes. Those are occasions and flashpoints and they do create grievances, especially the nature like the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act is something that makes sense in a lot of areas in England. It makes zero sense in New England, but when Parliament's trying to find ways to pay for the Seven Years' War, which protected American colonists, they're like, well, we need a new tax. Oh, let's come up with this. They come up with this idiotic idea, the Stamp Act, and let's impose it in a place with lawyers and clerks uh, where they abound and everyone uses paper. They now pay tax on paper to the crown. It's a really dumb idea. Um, <laughs> George heard the colonists were upset about it, and he told his men in Parliament to have the Stamp Act withdrawn. Now, if we are upset about a tax and the president hears about it, how often is the president working to undo those taxes. Uh, yeah, that doesn't actually happen. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, you stole, you know, England is this wonderful place. And I mean, the defeat of George's policies then over here are also the defeat of his policies in England. And England would probably look yeah. a lot different if that hadn't happened. But it did. And that's a fact. And better or worse, that's our country. And the United States, it, it is our country. And again, we should wish to make it better. And we're not going to undo that revolution. So just to put that out there. But just, you know, laying out these kind of facts. Now, what would Bellarmine think? Based on Bellarmine's political philosophy, the, the naked facts of so many of these things, I don't think he would consider those just reasons for revolution. But once you get to the Treaty of Ghent and the English crown acknowledges the independence of the 13 colonies, 
from that point on, and they establish a government, and the government is received and accepted by the people, and then endures, you know, Bellarmine would consider that a legitimate government. So uh, based on all the principles they laid down. But was the United States a Catholic, you know, creation? No, it wasn't. I mean, the principles <laughs> are far more current in Protestant thinking than they are in Catholic. And especially because you're talking about the direct representation. Popular sovereignty in Bellarmine and Suarez does not mean voting. It does not mean everyone gets to go vote in elections because Bellarmine's not a Republican. He's a monarchist. It just means that the origin of political authority comes from the people itself because the object of the monarch's rule is to provide you know, peace and tranquility for the people so they can acquire the goods and services necessary to raise up children in the church and, and get them to heaven and get themselves to heaven. That's ultimately mm-hmm. the monarch's job is to provide peace and security in the realm for the people. His position exists for the people, not like in King James the first absolutist notion, his patriarchal notion in um, his book on the law of free monarchy, where James argues a hundred percent for absolutist rule that, well, the king's got, you know, it, the king's being a king is like a sacramental system. It's like a sacrament and, you know, it, it exists for its own purpose to be king. And this, the king can only be judged by God, not by the Pope, not by the people. And, and that's flies in the face. I mean, just look at St. Thomas and that goes flies in the face of St. Thomas Aquinas. So, I mean, Theodore Beza and Calvin and, um, you know, during the English civil war, the, the levelers, the, uh, the new model army, Cromwell, all these people who are the Algernon Sidney, um, mm-hmm. John Locke, they would have all been very surprised to, to, hear that they held to an essentially Catholic system. It's just the common current of the notions of European government. There's nothing particularly special about it. And so Bellarmine, you know, would have, again, if you, if you transported him up to 1776 and you gave him the bare facts of it, he might not find the cause, you know, just per se, at least on those principles, he might support it for other reasons. Like, Hey, there's a lot of Catholics on the side of the revolution. There's also Catholic loyalists the fight on the side of the yeah. crown too. So, but once the Treaty of Ghent happens, he'd call that a legit country. Mm. And so that's uh, that's kind of the reality of, of that situation. There's like it, it comes from that Jesuit tradition in the 19th century. We got to find a place for Catholics at the American table, not we need to convert the American table to being a Catholic table. So that yeah. the notion of what America is is something that in and of itself is good, and we need to take our place within it as good citizens by not rocking the boot. And that's mm. the view that wins out with, um, uh, you know, people like Henry Lloyd George, um, Monsignor Kenneth Ryan, uh, Father Courtney Murray. You know, that those are the that's the view essentially is America is something that is in and of itself good, not a nation to be converted. And that's not to say that. All the old crowns of Europe are, are you know, those wonderful Catholic countries are, are really our model because, I mean, especially since the French Revolution, they've all been models of disorder and problem. And right. so you look at Spain now, you look at Italy now, you look at France now. We're not going to turn around and say, well, America sucks because it's not Christendom. They're yeah. in a bad way, too. We all are. And so ultimately, the, the you know, I mean. There's freedoms in this country that that I enjoy. I, I had a chance to go back to Italy, and I, I probably would have done it just for the food and the culture alone. But there's certain you know, there's there's a trade off. You know, there's certain rights. This is my homeland. One, mm-hmm. um, and, and you know, even though at least at the time I had this option, I spoke Italian pretty fluently. Now it's dropped a bit because so I don't keep it up. I can read in it, but it, speaking takes a while to get back into. But just the same, um, you know, there's certain things. I, right now, I'm carrying a pistol. In Europe, I could not do that, All right? And so right. I, um, even in Switzerland, where they have large gun rights, I would walk. I mean, nobody does it. You know, it's uh, <laughs> that that's something that's particularly American, right? And mm-hmm. then, you know, other, other freedoms we have. Then there's other things that don't work so well. So you, you got to say, all right, well, I have these trade-off of goods going from this yeah. country to this one. Does that make Italy better? There's a lot of ways in which Italy is worse. And there's some things that makes it better. There's a lot of ways when America is better and some things that makes it worse. Right. Ultimately, it, you know, it's still my homeland. It's where I was born. And I'm an American. And living over, yeah. if I lived somewhere else, when I did live over there, I was an American living in Italy. I was not an Italian. You know? mm. So that's just that's just reality. So I just know, yeah. I just wanted to put that out there. But when I, I talk about these things, it's not hate on America. It's not America's evil. It's not, you know, go back to England. You know, we've got to go back to England. It's like, no. None of that. It's here, but no, absolutely. And I think 
Than yeah, I think what you're what you're saying is very it's very realist, and it's also it shows the great deal of historical nuance that's required to actually speak on these issues. It, there's there's quite a lot going into them, so that's a, that's a great. Um, thank you for laying that out, and I, I I agree with your your assessment on that. To kind of wrap things up, I wanted to ask you uh, to to conclude a a personal question. You mentioned earlier the 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 passing of your late wife, and may may she rest in peace. But I've noticed that you've you've gone through a, a good amount of of personal tragedy in your life, but still, I mean, even with your your smoking of your cigar there and the great enthusiasm that you you talk about the faith and all of these issues, you you maintain that that spirit of it's almost a spirit of Chesterton. I would say there's a great joy in your faith. What would you say to those who might be going through similar tragedies? How can they get through? How would you recommend they get through it? What can they do to still maintain that joy of the faith? That's hard because that's deeply personal to people's situations, but there's certain general things that can be applied. So I lost a daughter in 2019 and my wife on 12th March of last year. And yeah. I think it was a few months after um, I was getting up and doing things and a um, woman, her daughter came to help us out and help things. And she's just, she was a widow as well. And she's like, I can't believe you're even getting out of bed. Mm. And it was kind of surprising to her. It's like, well, stuff's got to get done and it's not going to, you know, I've got, uh, you know, eight other children. And so and it's not going to get done with me laying in bed. So it's just got to be, you know, got to happen. And there's very much a sense of got to, you know, got to keep things going. And she'd be really mad if I didn't keep things going. And if I just, uh, you know, let the world go to pot, because I'm not particularly feeling like living in the world at the moment. And, yeah. and, and, and I'm not going to lie, you know, leading up to and during and after, you know, I had some moments where I had to sit down and say, God, I don't know what you're doing. And I, I really don't understand this. And I would be very much lying if I said I was happy about all this because I'm mm. not. But there is a certain degree of, of you know, of surrender. You like you see in Job. And now you don't want to quote Job to somebody who's just lost their spouse. But the realization is there, and it is turning in my head, even you know, even at the funeral and after, and that. You know, we, we, one, I mean, she's happier than I could ever make her because she's reigning in heaven with Christ forever and ever. And that's something. Same, same with my daughter who was, who was baptized and died um, at 15 months. And so, again, went straight to heaven. My wife mm. certainly, I think, is in heaven based on the signs and the devotion and the sacraments and so on and so forth. But, you know, so that that is consoling, but it's not always a great consolation to the living have to continue on without someone, especially somebody as central and important as your wife. So there, there's basically, I mean, the one is, well, we got to keep on going. You have to keep getting things done. And the second is really some of its choice. Some of it is I could be miserable. I could die in the next couple of years from cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, I like to say tobacco and alcohol don't solve my problems, but they certainly make me feel better about them. <laughs> and um, and then used in moderation, both do make me feel mm -hmm. better about them, but they don't solve my problems and they don't fix anything. Um, make me a little bit poorer, especially because actually I could never be a drunk because of the fact that I have, my tastes are too high, right? <laughs> Some people can get away with bottom shelf. Uh, I, you know, would rather buy that $80 bottle of liquor than gradually drink it over the next two months, as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, buying some some horrible stuff that has more resemblance to paint thinner and just, just to have more of it. So as a result, my tastes are too high to be drunk. Thank goodness. Um, I probably could be if I really worked hard at it. But uh, I, I just don't have the natural desire to, to, to exist in that state. And mm -hmm. so I, I want to be happy. And the other thing is too, having children that depend upon you and you can't be miserable and dour and yelling at them. And I compare it to like Lent when I take on particularly hard ancient regimens during Lent uh, from the Eastern tradition, and which essentially goes vegan most of Lent. And you get grumpy, you get really grumpy, no cream in your coffee, no, uh, no meat, the entirety of Lent, no meat. Um, you know, even, even the things you really like, you have to really work around it. And it is a penance because it, you know, it doesn't always taste good. We're going to eat it anyway and offer it up and uh, not make a big thing about it and not... Uh, boast about it, but you know, it's just a reality. It's only one part of it. And 
you know, I think about going that I could end it at any time, but I'm going to keep going because it's good for God. But while I'm doing it, I have to be happy about it too. Because otherwise, what, what message am I sending my kids? Daddy's fasting and he's grouchy and he's, he's miserable and he's, he's yelling at us more. Are you really accomplishing? What's the purpose of the fasting then? If you're not becoming a better person, you're actually becoming worse. And so, and this is something I noted years ago when I first took on that regimen. And at times I was tempted to snap a little more because I was a little crankier because of, you know, it was like, well, wait, what's the point of the fasting if I'm going to have that, that attitude and that behavior? Let's turn it around. My temper can flare up really easily, but for about two minutes. And then I stop and I forget why I was mad. Because um, there's just a general desire to be happy. And part of that's my own struggles with depression back in my 20s. And I just simply decided I'm going to be happy. Mm. And you know, kind of looked at myself in the mirror. It's like, oh, it's such a lie. Yeah, well, we're going to try anyway. And then it just it, it flipped it flipped my mindset around, where my default position went from depressive and sad and, and melancholic to being happy. Hmm. And it's, or I should say cleric, not melancholic. So we're cleric. And now all of a sudden, it's in my general disposition is more upbeat, more positive. And the reason being, you know, I, I had flipped that in my very, my notion of existence, just, just to be happy. And I think that that disposition helped a good deal uh, with these tragedies, especially with uh, um, my wife. And, you know, it is hard. And then, you know, someone that is so uh, it's a great line in Frankenstein. And I wish I had the book here. So I quote it. I think I could put it up on Twitter at some point. So if I could go find it again. But um, where uh, when Victor Frankenstein loses his, his mother and he says, you know, how hard it is for for the body to, to to you know to to become accustomed to not having someone whose eyes were so normal to a sight to behold whose hands were such a normal um thing whose whose presence was such a, a normal um intimate part of life it's such such a beautifully written quote I, I can't even begin to do it justice i should have it committed to memory but i don't is it's hard that is it is like cutting off your arm and uh, it's um you know, and my wife really was very saintly. So how do you move on? And so part of it is the will and the determination to move on. And then there's also grace and there's also hope, you know, and, and those are the things that, um, you know, have to have to keep you going and remembering that as Bellarmine knew well enough with this life, this life is a sojourn. This life is a, um, I try to avoid the word because you have the, the pilgrim people of God as it shows up in so many modern things and it. Yes. It evaporates in so much blue bladder, you get tired of hearing it. It is a pilgrimage. This is not our home. Mm -hmm. Heaven's our home. And and she's home. And there's nothing more joyful than that, as hard as it is to bear in this world. And so mm. that's that's essentially the the attitude of how to have a witness. That doesn't mean there aren't bad days. There are bad days. That doesn't mean there aren't yeah, everything just goes to 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 heck and your your routine is completely destroyed. Um, that happens. And then you just have to get up and keep going and, mm. and uh, move on forward. So, Wow. Well, thank you so much for answering that, Ryan. That's, I think that's going to help uh, quite a few people. So, so thank you for that. Uh, Ryan, we can, where can we find uh, most of your material? www.mediatrixpress.com is uh, where all of, our, all of the, my works are published. Here's Bellarmine. Um, you can just search for it and everything will come up. Currently I have, obviously, on the Roman Pontiff, or the treatises on the church, which are all in one volume now uh, on councils, on the church militant, on the marks of the church. Um, and then I do sell the marks of the church and the uh, um, church militant separate uh, as little smaller books. Then there's... Um, the volume on mass, which is another one that's excerpted from the, the last bit of the, on the Eucharist. And that was mostly to raise some money as <laughs> I needed it. And I, I said, well, this will sell and I'll get it done faster than the entire treatise on the Eucharist, which is another 400 pages. So or, mm. or, or 200 pages. Then there's um, treatise on the sacraments in general and baptism and confirmation, which will lead. And there's a couple I skipped over in the meantime uh, on clergy and on monks. Those are good works and I'll get back to those. And fill them in um, further. There's uh, the rest of the sacraments on penance, and he deals with indulgences right after penance. 
And the original volume actually didn't have indulgences in it because he didn't get it to the printers in time. So it became a separate work. And, and uh, so I'll reinsert it where it was meant to go right after the treatise on penance. And then the, the, the sacraments on extreme unction, holy matrimony and order, or all the, that's a shorter treatise on all of those. So, because most of the principles for their defense have already been enumerated elsewhere, so he spends less time with them. Um, then there's the big massive work, which is going to take me all of the latter part of this year, probably next year too, and might have to mm. even bring some help in if I get some money, which is on um, <clears throat> everything that deals with justification. There's four major works on it. It's all it's a ton. It's like 800 pages in total in my wow. uh, this folio, which is, you know, they're pretty, pretty dense, pretty large. But... Um, mm. That is, let's see, there's on uh, the state of the first man in original sin and the loss of grace in the first man. Then there's this treatise on grace. Then there's this treatise on justification. And finally, the value of good works. And that pretty much rounds out all the major works of the controversy. So, so um, wow. there's two more that they're, they're published elsewhere. Uh, I, doctor, uh, if I get his name right, I always get it wrong. Peter Simpson, I think he has a website where he offers uh, translations that he does his academic work in PDFs and he did a translation without, you know, so many of the authorities and footnotes and everything, um, on, uh, two treatises of Bellarmine on the word of God and on, uh, on Christ, which are the first two treatises. So I skipped over those because I saw they were already done, I'm trying to get the things that aren't done <laughs> and then go back and do my own versions to get a nice full edition, nice, maybe get something nice, leather bound, it cost a lot of money, but uh, make it all nice and uniform and everything. So that's where it'll go eventually. Uh, I also just published uh, a translation of St. John Fisher, um, one of his Latin works against Luther. It's never been in print uh, in English before. Even though he was English, he wrote it in Latin for a European audience. And so he... Um, and it was extremely influential and popular in its own day, and just over the years has you know, uh, you know, fallen into neglect. And so we we're bringing it back, especially as there's so much discussion about Luther and the attitude <laughs> of so many seems to be, oh, well, look how wonderful Luther was. So uh, Fisher shows he was not, and why? Yeah. And so you have a saint and a holy martyr, the first cardinal martyr, to tell you everyone why. Luther's a problem. And so it's a defense of Henry VIII's work. And so it's called uh, Against Luther's Babylonian Captivity. And he wow. shreds the entirety of Luther's sacramental system and, you know, instead, and defends that the, the presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, uh, he'll do a fuller treatment in another book, which I think Angelus came out last year mm -hmm. uh, with um, his work against Oculopatius on the true presence of Christ in the, in the, of the body of the Lord in the Eucharist. I think that's the title. And so, and so in this one, I mean, he foresees a lot of those arguments, but he's mostly dealing with the masses, why the masses of sacrifice against Luther and defending the, the other sacraments against him. So uh, another, another phenomenal work and I'm glad to put that out. And then I have a lot of lives of saints. There's a lot of books that I don't translate. They're reprints, uh, given a new typeface and a little bit of editing. And so books, I should create a tab on the website saints you've never heard of because I, mm -hmm. I, I try to find things that approach proper, you know, historical biography, but at the same time are written from the light of Catholic faith. So, you know, not, not some secular book that's going to trash the faith or something. So th those are the types of biographies I tend to gravitate to rather than kind of more legendary, fabulous things uh, <clears throat> that have mm -hmm. you know, encroached in and gone into print. You know, there's a good evidentiary criterion for at least, you know, the general presentation of the life of the saints. So I've got a lot of saints nobody's heard of. I have a big four volume, uh, or it's a multi-volume work that I'm condensing into three volumes on St. Alphonsus Liguori mm. that uh, should have the first volume out pretty soon. Very big. So it's um, <clears throat> Father Tenoya's uh, biography on um, St. Alphonsus. And it's, it's a big, massive tome and everything. And there is an abridged version that's out there in PDFs, but the, the full unabridged version has never been published or it hasn't been published since Father Faber put it out. So we're going to put that out along with another volume, The Companions of St. Alphonsus. So it'll be a big three-volume work, and then it'll pretty much everything you want to know. Father Tenoya lived with Alphonsus for a very long time. It was very, uh, you, you know, assembled tons and tons of documents. And so it's just, just a really great work if you want to know everything about St. Alphonsus from the perspective of somebody who lived with him. So that'll be coming out uh, this month. 
Wow, fat. So we have a lot to look forward to, and there's so much on Mediatrics Press. So everybody go check that out. If you want to see more interviews like this one, you can go to CatholicFamilyNews.com uh, or just check out our YouTube channel here. And we'll put those articles that you mentioned that you wrote for us in the description as well. So, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. God bless.